Welcome to the Reason Roundtable, your weekly libertarian news cope, brought to you by the magazine of Free Minds and Free Markets. I'm Matt Welch, joined by Peter Suderman, Nick Gillespie, harumphing over there already in the corner, Rumpf. and sp- returning special guest star, Stephanie, Stephanie, Stephanie Slade, Slade, Slade. Welcome back, Slade, and hello, everyone. Thank you. Happy Hi, birthday. Matt. Happy birthday, Catherine Maggie Ward. And Kamala Harris. And Peter Suderman. Wow. Come on now. Let's a well, that's reverse right. yeah, backwards. Yeah, we discovered this year that uh, Catherine and I don't just share a birthday with each other, but with Kamala Harris. With the once and future vice president. Uh, we are going to let uh, Slade uh, here yell at me uh, about polling uh, in a moment. But first, uh, a word from our sponsors over at Qualia Life. Friends, do you feel as old as I look? Uh, then I've got one word for you, Senolytics. Senolytics is the name we give to a category of recently discovered ingredients, which could prove to be a game changer for enhancing and extending your physical and mental prime. Here's how Senolytics work. As we age, all of us accumulate senescent cells in our bodies. Senescent cells are the ones that cause symptoms of aging, aches and discomfort, slow workout recovery, sluggish mental and physical energy, and so forth. These zombie cells are old and worn out, taking up space and nutrients from your healthy cells. So now you can prune these dead cells by taking Qualia Senolytic. Qualia Senolytic is a vegan, gluten-free, non-GMO supplement, and you only need to take it twice a month to remove those zombie cells and keep them from making you feel old. To join the battle against aging, just go to qualialife.com slash roundtable. Get up to 50% off, then use the code roundtable at checkout for an additional 15% off. That's uh, Q-U-A-L-I-A life.com slash roundtable, or just go to your GNC locations. By whatever means, do it today. You'll be glad you did. Okay, last two weeks of presidential mm-hmm. campaign, I swear, at least until the next phase after the election. <laughs> uh, Slade, yeah. I have been a very, very good boy this year. I have not been talking very much or going too granularly into uh, polls, uh, but I cannot help but notice that it seems like things are more or less kind of tied. Maybe Kamala Harris is up a, a wee little bit in national um, uh, polling. Uh, and Donald Trump is up a wee little bit in the Electoral College kind of considerations. Uh, and yet about two weeks ago, the betting markets converged. Converged? No, they deconverged. They decoupled. They forked. Diverged. Uh, thank you. That's the word? Yeah. That's why they pay you the big bucks. Uh, It's like 60-40 in the betting markets now. Uh, I'm not really sure why. What uh, is going on here? What, if anything, should we be thinking about just in terms of media literacy, about the either trustworthiness of betting markets or anything else that you find personally significant or interesting in the current polling state of this very exciting presidential race? I think much like with polls, which I I always take pains to emphasize that there's high uncertainty with polls and we shouldn't put too much emphasis or, you know, trust the polls too much to be accurate predictions of the future. I think the same, roughly the same thing goes with the betting markets right now. That is to say, so with polls, start, start with polls. Some years, the polls are more or less right on the money and they do a good job of predicting how an election is going to turn out. Other years, they're off. And when they're off, sometimes they're off in the direction of erring, being too far towards Republicans and sometimes they're off in you know, the other direction of being too far towards Democrats. And until the election is over, we will not know which of these years we are in, right? Which one of these years. So we, we, we can look at the polls and they maybe um, they maybe will will be like we may look back and say, hey, they did a pretty good job of predicting the outcome of this election, or maybe we won't. It, it's just it's very, very difficult. There's just high uncertainty um, on what on what to take away from this. I think that something similar is true with the betting markets. That is to say some Years, perhaps, we will look backwards and look at the betting market and said, hey, they outperformed the polls. They did a better job of predicting the outcome of this election. They knew, seemed to know something that the polls didn't or pick up on something that the polls couldn't. Um, or maybe not. It may be the case that what, what we look backwards and, and see is that there were a couple of very, very deep pocketed people who are fans of Donald Trump and who either because they deeply believe that Trump is going to win 
or because they are hoping to boost his campaign in the final weeks, have decided to plow literally tens of millions of dollars into the Donald Trump stocks on the betting markets. That's what we've seen. Um, and so it, whether that actually tells us anything, I don't know. You don't know. Nobody knows until after the election. We won't be able to say. And so that's why I feel like, you know, I know this is a very unsatisfying answer that I repeatedly give, but that that is how I approach this sort of the idea of predicting the future is you just don't know until after the fact whether you whether you're doing a good job or not. Quick follow up, uh, Slade. Um, is there has there been in the Trump era, which is now kind of long, has there been an observed what uh, the old folks like me and Nick call the Bradley effect? where uh, people are kind of shy about telling pollsters that they're going to vote for Trump because he's seen as sort of like D class A or embarrassing or whatever. They just don't feel like admitting it. But then um, on election day, it turns out that there's more of those. And so that there's been a consistent undercount of support for Trump. Have we seen that as a consistent thing in his era? Well, you know, it's, it's a sample size of two. So it's a little bit hard to draw right. conclusions. I, yes, in the in the two pres pre previous presidential elections where Trump was on the ballot, we saw polls under you know underestimate how he would do. Um, but four years before that, we saw the polls underestimate how Obama would do compared to Mitt Romney. Right. So famously, Gallup missed that call. Um, so it, it's it's just. It may be the case that what we're seeing is what you're describing, that that's the explanation for why have the polls been off in that direction the last two times. But I'm just really reluctant to draw any kind of sweeping conclusions and, again, make make a firm prediction about the future based on a sample size of two. Very good. That's helpful. And thank you for it. Uh, Peter, uh, you live in Washington, D.C. Last time I checked. Unfortunately. Um, well, I thought you were the booster. You just is it soured? Your milk no, got sour because, there? No, it's because that means that every question I get on this podcast has to start with you live in Washington, D.C. And, Un untrue. And it's unfortunate. Untrue because you're from Florida and we do that too. <laughs> um, but uh, so let's presume a 49-49 nation or a 48-48 nation, which it yeah, kind of feels like. take it down a little bit. Yeah, I think it's uh, like 47-47. Uh, well, we're not going to get third parties getting 6% of the vote oh, right. this time, but, uh, divided minority, more minority, uh, nation, uh, and also a really divided Congress. We kind of don't know wh where that's going to go. Uh, it's just like it, the, the level of close and yet bitterly divided polarization is incredible. Can you explain from your perch there in Washington, DC, um, what are the kind of consequences of this from a practical governing standpoint of the federal government when the country is so close, kind of hates each other politically, and it's just incredibly neck and neck with the slimmest of margins? So that's a good question. Uh, in terms of the way that the government functions, what it means is that we have these kind of intense swings back and forth, especially in the executive branch. In terms of regulation, things get sort of um, get enacted and then it get immediately unenacted. Un it means that it's very difficult to get Congress to do anything um, because the the divide is so uh, is, is so precariously balanced. Um, and even more than that, the underlying factors here really lead to a politics that is almost entirely about trying to tear down the other team. There's a very good report out uh, from the American Enterprise Institute from two scholars there, Yuval Levin and Roy Tesharia. I hope I'm pronouncing that sort of correctly, Slade, Tashera, if I'm Tashera, sorry, um, uh, that, that argues that we are living in an unusual moment of American politics in which there is no real majority party. Instead, we have a minority, a two minority party system. And what we've historically had, they argue, is, is a system where typically you have a majority party whose main job is to manage a complex coalition. If you're a majority party, the, you, you're going to have a big, messy coalition, and your job is basically just to hold it together. Uh, but you do that by offering them stuff and by sort of maintaining a vision for what the country should be. And then the minority party tries to break in by saying, by poking holes in your theory of the case, by saying, your vision for the country is bad. Well, now what we have are two minority parties that don't have a vision for the country. They just have an argument that the other side is bad. And that affects elections. That affects uh, you see that it, the, the last several elections with Donald Trump in particular have just been votes about which which side you hate more. But that also affects governance. In particular, it affects Congress because Congress isn't willing to actually go ahead and do stuff and to cut bipartisan deals. The parties themselves are in some ways quite timid about what they are proposing because they, they don't view their job as to lead. They view their job as to undercut the other side. And that creates this just intensely negative uh, politics, uh, a politics that isn't about a big idea for what we should do and what America should be and what American government should be doing and should 
should be four. Uh, so we just have this 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 really sort of ugly situation. Um, it also means that no party can pull ahead. And that's why we have this very close presidential race and a very uncertain election coming up. Nick, uh, speaking of Rui Teixeira. Um, yeah. And uh, and uh, who I'm thinking about a lot this time is uh, Patrick Ruffini, who you've had mm-hmm. several conversations with, yeah. uh, pollster and, and analyst and strategist. I talk exclusively to white ethnics when uh, I think about the future of this country, Matt Walsh. I, I mean, like the, why, why add the suffix, uh, yeah. Nick? Um, uh, have you been? Uh, are you drinking their Kool Aid? Like, is, are, do you perceive? the um the kind of the fundamental interesting thing about this election being the massive shift in what is described as working class non-college educated voters uh from democrats to republicans um and uh does it seem to feel to you to be like uh, uh like the the bones of a realignment uh, yes and no. Uh, there's no question that uh, the Democratic Party, and it's now been over a series of candidates, so we know that it's not simply a particular candidate, but the uh, Democratic Party is pulling fewer blacks and Hispanics, uh, going back to Hillary Clinton, uh, you know, uh, Joe Biden and Kamala Harris are all doing relatively terribly. A uh, recent New York Times Santa College poll had Harris Uh, getting 78% of uh, black voters to Trump's 15%. That's 70% and 20% when it comes to black men. Uh, These are historically low numbers. I mean, you basically have to go back to uh, the 1960 election to find those kinds of numbers uh, showing up. With Hispanics, she's also not doing particularly well. Uh, And Trump actually, in terms of Hispanic men, is doing better than her with 49% of Hispanic men saying they're going to vote for him over 44% for her. Um, But to the larger question, like, you know, there's still a long way to go for that to be a full realignment. Uh, The Democrats still get most of the vote uh, in households below $50,000 and things like that. So this idea that the Republican is uh, the Republican Party is becoming the populist hotbed for working class Americans. It can be overstated and routinely is. But something's happening here. And I think th- what what is happening here, Matt, is that each of the parties are minority parties and they deserve to be because they are terrible. And the coalitions they were designed to represent just don't exist anymore, which is why we're talking about 47 percent and 47 percent. Uh, rather than even 49, 49, you know, or or split at 50, 50. Um, I'll take issue with some of the things that uh, Peter said. What happens when uh, you don't have a majority Congress isn't that big legislation doesn't get passed. We've seen, you know, wh- whether it was Obamacare, whether it was the Trump tax cuts at the Inflation Reduction Act, um, you can pass massive legislation that's super costly with a minority or a bare squeaky tight majority in Congress. And that happens, you know, on a regular basis. And then the the worst thing, um, we've talked about this in the past, when I started writing about budget issues, federal budget issues in the early 2000s, you could always say, you know, there was discretionary and um, uh, mandatory spending, each accounting for about 50% of the federal budget. That is simply not true anymore. And it's closer to 75% of spending is on autopilot. And that autopilot is constantly expanding, which helps explain why we're now in an era of $6 trillion plus budgets. And we're not, there is, you know, it doesn't matter who wins. And even if if Trump wins with 60% of the vote and gets the Senate and Congress, that spending's not going down. It's, it's probably going to go up even more. Um, you know, and the same thing with uh, with Harris. Um, so we're in a bizarre situation, um, one where a, a party that wins uh, the presidency and the Congress has two years to do exactly what it wants. They do that and then they get voted out in the midterms. And then oftentimes that that uh, turn against them, the, you know, the uh, incumbent might win again in the presidency, but they lose uh, you know, they continue to lose all or most of Congress. So um, the the worst thing from a libertarian point of view is that this has nothing to say about the size, scope and spending of government, which just keeps getting bigger and bigger. 
Well, well think- I think that's part of the dynamic here, because when you have two parties that act as minority parties, just criticizing the other side, then you have no party that wants to defend its own record in a really serious way. And so that is something that you're seeing on the campaign trail with Kamala Harris. When you when she is asked to defend the Biden administration record, she'll say, on the one hand, well, you know, I, I there's no real daylight between me and Joe Biden. I can't think of anything major that I would do differently. But she won't really offer an affirmative defense of what they have done. And in fact, her campaign slogan is something like, let's turn the page and move or move forward. Like, it's like, we're going to be let's different. Let's do it again. Well, how? I mean, we're going to talk about this more Skeeter a little boo. bit later. But I, but what you have is, what you have are two parties that, that just sort of keep passing these giant budgets, that just sort of uh, keep pushing through you know, more and more spending. But then there's no real discussion about it because all they want to do is say, the other guy is bad. The other guy is bad. Just vote for me because the other guy is bad, not because I did this thing that is great. In fact, when you had Joe Biden try to defend his record, he'd spent four or five months in the summer of 2023 uh, doing, you know, speeches about how Bidenomics was great, defending his big economic policies. Uh, it didn't take. In fact, Bidenomics became less po- popular during during the time that he was giving those speeches. So defenses are not working. It is entirely an offensive game in which you uh, try to knock the other side down, um, and that means that there's no scrutiny towards the the uh, a, a lot towards a lot of the really big economic issues that we like to talk about. That the uh, that the two parties have basically ignored. The two presidential candidates have basically ignored throughout this race. There's there is no real discussion of the uh, the debt and the deficits, and there's also been very little discussion of the big tax cliff that is coming next year. Even though this has been, in some ways, thanks to Trump's uh, you know tax pandering, a tax policy uh, heavy race. I you know the one thing is Trump is running on his record, and he ignores. COVID, uh, you know, in, in a way that it is still should be sh- stunning that we're not really having a discussion at all about how either Trump or Biden slash Harris acted during COVID. Uh, but, you know, one of the big problems here, <clears throat> and this is why spending goes up regardless of anything, is that the Republican Party now is not a party of small government. It does not even pretend. J.D. Vance is not saying, <clears throat> Excuse me, when we get him, well, you know, okay, we'll kill the uh, Department of Education, but he's not talking about cutting spending on anything, and neither is Trump. I mean, Trump talks about how much money he gives to people, uh, you know, so it, it's, a, it's a very different world. Trump left office complaining that his party wasn't willing to rubber stamp even more larger checks out to the uh, to the American people uh, during during the COVID the, the the early days of COVID. Right? He he we we got a round of checks, then we got another round of checks, but the second round of checks wasn't big enough for him, and he was mad at his own party that they wouldn't spend more money just handing out cash to Americans. And then of course Biden came in and gave even bigger another round of even bigger checks. So it is just a race to the bottom in terms of how do we who can who can you know shower the American people with more taxpayer dollars. There's absolutely no um, even lip service being paid to fiscal responsibility anymore. I do think, though, that this that sort of the wrong lessons can be drawn from this and have been drawn from this by many in the sort of Republican political operative space, which is they say, ah, Trump did really well in 2016 unexpectedly and surprisingly well with certain constituencies um, in 2020, um, it must be because he abandoned fiscal responsibility. That's the causal mechanism here. That's the explanation for his, for him doing better than anybody saw coming. Um, there's no, there's no, voters don't want fiscal responsibility. Well, there's probably something to that, but I am very, I, I've written about the idea of real, realignment for a reason. And I'm strongly in the camp that what's going on with this, with this realignment is much more explained by Certain constituencies being pushed out of the Democratic coalition by being really turned off by their insane cultural positions and not people being attracted to the Republican coalition by Trump's economic policies. I think that pretty much Patrick Ruffini says this, Rui Teixeira says this, that it's much more about culture and identity questions than it is about economic questions that explains this realignment. And in fact, as a couple of you alluded to, it's probably better to think of it in terms of a de-alignment more than a realignment, at least when it comes to the racial categories that like what we used to think of as Hispanic or black voters as being clearly aligned with the Democratic Party. Now they're not realigned with the Republican Party. They're just less aligned. They're less, less overwhelmingly committed to either party. On the education question, there is more evidence, I think, of a true realignment. That is to say, if you don't have a college degree, you are vastly, overwhelmingly more likely to be a Republican voter now than you used to be and vice versa. Yeah, but the majority is still you're going to be a Democratic voter. 
Well, if you don't Slade, have a yeah, let let me uh, let me uh, follow up with you then, since one of your kind of projects is exploring you know the the last remaining shreds of uh, fusionism in the old Republican conservative kind of coalition. Um, did the rise of Trump and all things associated with it, and the dealignment and kind of uh, culture war stuff, was that a way of of, was it sort of like a shock to the system for those of us who spend all of our time nattering on about political ph philosophy? Because it turns out no one cares about that stuff. Uh, <laughs> and if so, what the hell are you doing with your life? Yeah. Well, that's a great question. I don't have an answer to that one. Um, yeah. I mean, I guess start with the definition of fusionism. I maybe am somewhat idiosyncratic, which is to say I am insistent that the right understanding of the idea of fusionism was in the mid-20th century, the conservative movement came up with this idea that what it means to be a conservative in the American context is to care about both liberty and virtue, and that these two things are mutually reinforcing, both are necessary to human flourishing, a good society must be both free and virtuous, and so you can't just care about one or the other. You can't just be a pure libertarian who never asks the questions about what is a virtuous life. And you also can't do what so many on the right today want to do, which is Im impose and enforce virtue at the point of a gun and say, forget, you know, to hell with your individual liberty. We just want to make society virtuous, whether they like it or not. That neither of these things works because these liberty and virtue need each other. That, that was the idea of fusionism, that they're fused, necessarily fused. And I'm trying to recover that understanding, and I'm not sure that I'm doing a very good job of it. Um, it's <laughs> But but I'm gonna I'm gonna keep fighting because I'm on, under contract to write a book about it. You are uh, doing a good job of it. It's <laughs> everyone else who's doing a terrible job of recovering that understanding. Um, I guess the main thing I would say here is if that was what the 20th century understanding of what the um, conservative uh, movement in America stands for, Donald Trump represents an abandonment of all of these things. Right? The, the the MAGA movement is not does not does not care about individual liberty. It does not care about free markets, right? It's, it's abandoned all that for, you know, in all the ways that we've been talking about on spending, on scope of government, on sort of embracing of a, of a muscular strongman approach to wielding state power. Um, and on virtue, I mean, the same people who 20 years ago were talking about how character counts when it was Bill Clinton who was running for office clearly do not think that virtue is an important characteristic when they're casting their ballots for Donald Trump. So both virtue and liberty have now been kind of lost. And it's entirely, I think, becoming um, a cult of personality around one man and or um, maybe this is actually a, a better, fairer way to say it. It is entirely about owning the libs and beating the libs and de defeating the libs, um, whatever it takes to get there. There's no principles involved anymore. There's no philosophy. There's no even attempt to make a philosophical case anymore, unfortunately. I think that's a huge loss. Nick, um, you've talked a lot about kind of the the first moment of our long kind of bad er era of national politics was the 2000 election and the, um, the super closeness of it and everyone disputing it. The Supreme Court case, 5-4, blah, blah, blah. Um, uh, and this leads also to people not really fully accepting the results of the election. And when it's getting worse and worse and worse over time, that particular part of it, uh, what lies do you think the losers, whoever they are, will tell themselves uh, starting uh, 16 days from now? Oh, it, you know, that the election was rigged, uh, you know, the, the machines were off, certain votes weren't counted. Russia, you know, tipped the scales or, uh, you know, dangerous county level, you know, uh, masterminds, Professor Moriarty's of election committees and things like that. I think that'll become less and less compelling, uh, you know, to most people, because I think most people recognize that this is just going to be a super tight election and that it can go in either direction. So I'm actually less worried about uh, kind of election fraud issues coming up. Uh, because I think people are tiring of that. They've uh, they've they've lost the steam. I will note uh, just on the double slash triple uh, hater tip. A uh, poll came across my desk this morning from the AP uh, favorability among uh, the uh, presidential and vice presidential candidates. Donald Trump, who might well win, who the betting markets think is going to win, uh, has is eighteen percentage points underwater. <laughs> favorability he's got a 40 percent favorability rate uh and 58 percent negative uh, but he's got a you know he's got like a 90 in the mid to high 90s approval rate or not approval rating but republicans say they're going to vote for him gonna vote for him yeah. at exactly the same levels that they say they're going to vote for their candidate every time and you know what has happened over time is the democratic party is the one 
that is at or near historic lows in identification because they kind of suck. And this is where I think Rui Teixeira is particularly on point of saying that the Democratic coalition has stopped even you know, trying to address uh, rhetorically the issues that kind of working class Democratic voters um, had. And somebody like Donald Trump does a better job of reaching out to them by saying, and this, you know, he does not have a coherent ideology, but he's got three big talking points that resound really well. One is that the immigration border situation and more broadly, immigrants are bad and they're fucking you over if you're like working class or if you're, you know, just getting to the middle class. Uh, he uh, also says, you know, that we shouldn't be involved in as many foreign wars or anything like that. Um, and he, you know, these these are ideas that play well. And then he also says, like, I'm not going to touch uh, Medicare and Social Security. Uh, and those are big issues. And the Republicans, I mean, Paul Ryan never actually, you know, committed anything to cutting anything in Medicare, uh, you know, but that attack on the Republicans that they were coming for your old age entitlement stuck because it seemed to somehow cohere with the idea that Republicans were eventually going to stop spending more every year in government. Uh, so Trump has like three major talking points that resound well, not just with uh, working class people, but with a lot of Americans who are in a period of, you know, we, for all of this century, we've been in a period of flux and transition where the economy has been changing. Uh, we had the financial crisis. We had COVID. Uh, you know, we've, uh, we have the threat of war in the Middle East as well as in Europe. Uh, you know, Trump is addressing those concerns directly in a way that I think just resonates better with people. Trump is running as the flaming orange sword of vengeance against all American elites, uh, global elites as well, but American elites in particular, and, and I would say specifically uh, in government to some extent, but even more than that, in the media. And a huge amount of uh, Trump's appeal, this is not why I find him, this is, I, I do not respond to this myself, uh, to be clear, but I think a huge amount of his appeal is that he is somebody who makes, uh, who makes liberal annoying people in the media really really mad and every time he says something crazy those people get extra mad and you can see that on twitter especially over this uh, last weekend and that that politics it's a sort of almost a politics of pure resentment and you see that playing out in some ways that are kind of funny like when trump goes and uh play acts as a, a fry cook at mcdonald's and then you see it also play out in ways that are more like terrifying like when trump is threatening to pull the broadcast licenses of uh for journalism that he finds unpleasant that he doesn't like um you know it, but it's but that is the whole pitch yes there's a an economic pitch and i think actually elon musk is, is is making that pitch better than than Trump is right now, running around talking about size of government and regulation and all of that, as he says, we've got to take back the country and, and win Trump. But Trump himself, his pitch is, hey, you have been forgotten. These wackos at the top, they have ignored you. Uh, they don't understand you. They don't live lives that they don't have. They don't share your values. They don't live lives that are cognizable to you, and they don't care about you at all. And I care about you and everything. It, whenever they hate me, that's their hatred for you, and we're going to throw it back in their faces by putting me back in the White House. I think that there's a, um, a distinct advantage that Trump has. That also explains kind of how someone who's 18 uh, points with an unfavorable rating, whereas Kamala Harris has five points favorable, believe it or not, 51 to 46, uh, at least according to that AP poll, um, is that uh, you can vote for Trump as a way to stick it to them with a capital T. Uh, and I'm trying to think of who is the them that Kamala Harris voters derive a similar satisfaction from. Yeah, OK, Trump and the MAGA people, but the them that, that they're trying to get it to, you know, the people that made my you know dad or my grandpa lose their minds watching Fox News. It's a perennial like a New York magazine type of story. Um, the them don't really bum you out at work. <laughs> you know, too much. Uh, the, the them don't have a lot of control over your lives. You don't feel uh, you don't feel aggressed in some ways um, uh, because there's so much commanding heights capture in the culture by the them from the point of view of uh, Trump supporters. Um, it's a much more obvious uh, play. I, you know, I, I actually think, though, that 
the you know the the people that they could do and you've seen this at the state level where democrats say well you know what trump wants to do and republicans and it's actually even better to pick you know at people like carrie lake or a jd vance or something like that they want to take away not just abortion rights but birth control they say really weird things about reproduction uh they are you know they will uh you know they are going to enforce some kind of theocracy on you and things like that um, and I think, you know, that actually plays pretty well. It's important to remember that the Republican Party should have won massively in the 2022 midterms. And they did not. They underperformed incredibly because they are filled with insane, batshit, crazy people like the black Nazi lieutenant governor of North Carolina. And it's like he's not atypical. He's, you know, he actually is, you know, like a better spokesman for Republicanism than a Herschel Walker. Who couldn't even win in a walkover, you know, in 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 a Georgia Senate race, and Georgia is a is a state that has gone Democratic basically because of the quality of state level candidates that the Republican Party is running. So uh, there there there's a them out there. I mean, Kamala Harris is not doing a very good job of activating it. The them in in so many ways is the this goes back to the polarization question that we started with, because the them is college educated. Uh, professionals in white collar jobs who live in big cities who control technology culture and the government and that's trump's them and that is that like i don't know whether this is you know there's a chicken and an egg problem here like does this explain or is this a uh, the this does, does this explain what's happening or is this a result of what's happening but what is happening here is that we have polarized along lines of the you know, the, the email jobs versus the I actually pick stuff up and put it in a pickup truck jobs. We have polarized along educational lines. And the them for Trump is always the college educated folks who will not vote for him and who hold a huge uh, just the vast, vast, vast majority of jobs in media, in technology, in knowledge production, in academia, in government and the people who who say stuff for a living and who pronounce on the way the world should be. And that is his them. And it is a very effective them. All right, we're going to get to our listener question of the week here in a moment. But first, friends, uh, do you feel as old as I look uh, after a night of enjoying a bucket or two of cocktails? Well, you don't have to, thanks to a little thing we like to call pre-alcohol. Many people are saying uh, that Z-Biotics pre-alcohol probiotic drink is the world's first gen genetically engineered probiotic. It was invented by PhD scientists to tackle rough mornings after drinking. Here's how it works. When you drink, alcohol gets converted into a toxic byproduct in the gut. It is this byproduct, not dehydration, that's to blame for your rough morning after. Pre-alcohol produces an enzyme to break this byproduct down. Just remember to make Z-Biotics your first drink of the night, then drink responsibly, and you'll feel your best tomorrow. So go to zbiotics.com slash roundtable to learn more about this game changer and get 15% off your first order when you use roundtable at checkout. Zbiotics is backed uh, with a 100% money back guarantee. So if you're unsatisfied for any reason at all, they'll refund your money, no questions asked. Remember to head to zbiotics.com slash roundtable. Use the code roundtable at checkout for 15% off. Do it today. You'll be glad you did. All right. Reminder, uh, email your brief queries to roundtable at reason.com. This one comes from TLK, Tulk, who writes, it seems that the roundtable gang does not obviously lean Trump or Harris in the upcoming elections. I agree. Both candidates are bad policy wise from a libertarian perspective. However, there's a strong argument in my mind for Trump that I'd like your take on. Supreme Court nominations, and perhaps other similar nominations. Trump's nominations to the Supreme Court were arguably a strong win for liberty. It is likely that one or even two nominations will occur during the next presidential term. Moreover, unlike with policies that can be easily reversed, uh, Supreme Court nominations are long-lasting and can have significant and prolonged effects. Isn't this a strong reason, or at least a reason enough, to favor Trump over Harris Slade, I'm hearing but Gorsuch. <laughs> I I think that there, you know, I, I almost come to the opposite conclusion of the of the reader, even though I agree with the premise that, you know, there are many good. I think it's very likely that Trump's, you know, 
picks for the Supreme Court or in all judicial appointments would be people I would be more likely to agree with and like to see in those positions. Um, But my concern is in the same way that we were just talking about how people on the right today, um, sort of Republican voters, see all these people in the elite sort of centers of cultural production, academia, Hollywood, um, right, like the, 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 um, the mainstream media as being powerful people who are overwhelmingly opposed to us. Um, and that, that makes them that makes them feel like, well, we've already lost our culture. We've already lost our society. There's nothing to preserve here anymore. Let's just tear it all down. Like anything goes, anything we have to do in order to defeat them is, is possible because like these institutions are so far gone that they can't be won back in any kind of fair fight. So let's fight unfair. I think that the same thing is happening right now with the left in terms of its approach to how it thinks about the courts. And you start to see them flirting with really dangerous ideas like court packing and other forms of quote unquote reform that are that are not that are not just I mean, that they would be very, very dangerous. And it's because they say like, well, this institution is so far gone that the other side isn't playing fair. They, right, they, they say they, they're going to play by one set of rules and then they change their mind when it befits them. This is exactly what happened with with the um, Ruth Bader Ginsburg uh, vacancy followed by the or the Scalia versus Ruth Bader Ginsburg vacancy. They say we're going to play by one set of rules and then when it benefits them, they play by another set of rules. Republicans aren't fighting fair. They've taken they've captured this institution unfairly and therefore it's no longer a legitimate institution. We don't have to follow its its rulings. And we we are justified in doing whatever we want to do and whatever we need to do in order to sort of take the country back, including burning things down. Um, and I think quite literally burning things down is what we're going to see if Trump wins this election. So I, I don't think that on the left, we were talking earlier about whether the sort of election fraud um, allegations are likely to be as strong this time around. I don't know. Uh, I think that if Trump wins, it's less about making allegations of election fraud and more about actual riots in streets in cities across the country. Um, and, and that's because of this sense that the that certain institutions have been captured by the right. This is this this seems crazy to people who are on the right who are so used to thinking in terms of the institutions that have been captured by the left, which there are many, of course. But people on the left feel like institutions are being captured, the judiciary, the Supreme Court being the obvious one and one of the most powerful institutions in our country that they feel has been illegitimately captured. And so anything goes. Anything goes at this point. Why not burn things down? That's my fear. So, so you're why- predicting that if Trump wins a second term, there's going to be riots in the street. Yeah, I mean, like we saw violent, some of that. flame-filled riots, mostly peaceful riots. That's my fear. Back. That's my yeah. fear. Okay. Yeah. You're uh, not predicting it. But doesn't that, uh, uh, Slade, lead you to agree with, not disagree with, Tulk, uh, saying that the Tulk. Supreme Court, <laughs> TLK, uh, that the Supreme Court is a good reason to vote for Trump? No, I, I'm saying exactly the opposite. I'm saying that Trump being able to fill even more seats on the Supreme Court exacerbates this problem of the left seeing this institution as being illegitimate. So you're and yielding if, to the heckler's veto. I'm I'm saying I'm saying this is my fear. This is my fear. And, and again, in the same way that it's it's as far as I'm concerned, like the fact that the mainstream media is mostly populated, almost exclusively populated by people on the far left who are, are biased. I agree with the I agree with all of these um the you know the complaints that people on the right have about the mainstream media or higher education or whatever. Um I don't think that it justifies burning things down, but I think that if you don't recognize what's what's causing people to feel like they're under threat and like they're not they don't have buy-in into institutions, you're playing with fire. That's my that's my point. So I don't I wouldn't say like we want to we, we need to do whatever it takes including supporting Donald Trump in order to get more seats on the Supreme Court is a, is an argument that speaks to me. I think we potentially are destabilizing our country by thinking in those terms. Nick, how do you answer Tulk's question? Uh, I am uh, less concerned about the uh, Supreme Court, I think, than many uh, libertarians or conservatives and probably even liberals are. Uh, I still what echoes in my head is an interview I did with Mark Tushnet, who is a far left by his own you know, uh, definition, a, a, a far left wing radical when it comes to legal theory and whatnot. And he said, you know, for better or worse, the Supreme Court is sometimes it's a little bit ahead of public opinion. Sometimes it's a little bit behind. uh, But mostly what it does is certify the direction that the country is already heading in. It rarely starts something new and different and radical. And, uh, you know, I so, um, you know, as as just as a as a point of thought, I just I, I don't think that the Supreme Court is a reason to vote for or against somebody in a fundamental way. Uh, for president. Peter, how do you answer the question? So just to sort of 
to jump off of what Nick said, I, I agree that the Supreme Court is not usually a, a big leading indi- – it's a, like a little bit of a leading indicator. It doesn't push the country in a brand new and totally radical direction. Uh, it stays more or less within the realm, right around of the realm of the average of opinion. At the same time, the Supreme Court there, – there are a lot of things that the Supreme Court rules on where there is no clear opinion. In particular, a bunch of the technical cases about administrative procedure, property rights, that sort of thing. It's just not like a, a clear, obvious. Most voters don't have very strong opinions about some of those things, like Chevron deference, for example, and the fisheries case that underlied uh, the Chevron deference ruling here. And that was a big one, but there are a lot of smaller cases along those lines. And those decisions matter. Uh, and those decisions matter a lot for property rights and for, um, for, for business owners and uh, for the rule of law um, and for restraining, even at the margins, the executive branch. So I think that that the the letter writer has a has a good point, um, even a very good point. At the same time, you have to balance the Supreme Court against all of the other stuff that that Trump would bring to another term, and all of the other stuff bring means all of the potential crazy lawlessness. It means threatening your enemies uh, in the media with um, authoritarian you know, shutdowns of, of uh, like I said, of, of broadcast networks. This is something that Trump has been harping about uh, since he started running for president, you know, a decade or so or uh, ago or so, but also a lot like in the last couple of weeks. Um, and then also things like a 20 percent tariff. Now, maybe that doesn't happen. But if you are voting for Trump on the hope that his signature economic policy proposal does not happen, uh, that's not a great reason to vote for somebody. <laughs> um, I will answer the question as saying, yeah, it's fine. It's a fine, uh, uh, like, you know, rationale. Um, I, I'm a firm believer that um, voting rationales are like, let's see, how do I clean this up? Are like armpits. Uh, everyone's got one or two of them and they all kind of stink uh, equally. Um, and yeah, that's uh, so bad, man. Thank you. Um, well, it's at least. Uh, Can't you just say the Supreme Court is something that people use to justify the vote they were going to make anyway? No, because that's what you want to say. What no, I'm I just want, saying, like, do you know anybody who is like, oh, you know, I really hate everything about Trump, except uh, maybe he'll, you know, uh, point the right people on the Supreme Court. I don't think. I, so. I think that yeah. was actually a pretty common uh, way of thinking no. by pro-life folks in the previous cycles. Well, yeah. they got what they wanted, right? Um, but what I want to say, if uh, Nick ever lets me, um, is that uh, th- my uh, problem with any, like, this is my one issue, right? Like Andrew Sullivan, I'm sure, has many one issues that he's going to flip-flop on between now and Election Day. He already has a couple of times. But you can, you know, it could be a free speech. You could decide that one party in particular is censorious and the other one is not. In fact, I saw Martin Gurry had a piece in the Free Press making just that yeah. argument, and that's why he's going to vote for Trump. Trump? Uh, uh, sure. So you can have any one issue be your overriding one. It's your litmus test. It's your all I care about is this. Could be war. Could be, you know, and many of these are important. And the Supreme Court is important, and there is kind of a clear difference between the parties. Could be education. There's a pretty clear difference between the parties on education right now. It's one of the few uh, policies. However, whatever that issue is, um, if it becomes so important that it is your coin toss, it is your litmus test, it is your I will always vote for this. Then, what do you do when the person who is good on that also is a child molester? Um, you're right. Like at some wow. point mm. there has to be right there. Did anybody say. see that coming? Uh, I just did. trying, just trying yeah. to, uh, make sure that everyone's awake. Um, but no, what happens if the person who is good on the issue is wretched, possibly criminal on, uh, all number of other issues. Um, and when, when does that rise to the level of being something that you object to? I see a lot of people, especially those who support Trump, but also in different ways, those who support Kamala Harris, uh, find ways to sort of minimize <laughs> the, uh, the horrible, uh, behavior policies, whatever of the person they support, because they have talked themselves into, this is my one issue and I will vote based on that issue. So, so all these rationales are interesting and they and could be worthwhile. Um, I would just invite people who have them to then weigh it against 
um, other things and ask themselves what is the level of behavior at which even that rationale is not good enough. All right. Uh, There's let's... a great old Calvin and Hobbes cartoon in which Calvin just like rants for the first three panels about how he's a single issue voter for dinosaur research. And the whole point is just like he's just an absolute maniac on this one little thing. And it makes him kind of deranged. Thank you, Peter Suderman. All right. Uh, quickly now, we have uh, uh, time to talk about Kamala Harris's interview. Sit down with Brett Baer last week, Fox News, prime time. Um, it's kind of was hard to watch uh, unless you had to. Uh, let's go around the table and have uh, one takeaway each from a thing that we noticed in that interview that we find of interest. Peter, why don't you lead us off? So the middle section of that interview, which is 21 minutes long, so we start with like seven minutes on immigration. The middle section is, how would you be different from Joe Biden? And it starts with Brett Byer uh, playing a bunch of clips in which Kamala Harris is like, well, I don't really see any daylight between it, everything Joe Biden did and uh, and what I would do. And uh, I'm the difference is I'm literally a different physical person. And that's all she can say. And it's wow. just this amazing thing of like, where he Powerful. starts with it, he frames this as like, well, you know, voters think we're on the wrong track. They're not big fans of Biden's economic record. What would you do? Your 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 campaign pitch is turn the page. Let's go forward. Like your slogans all like I'm going to be different. So describe how you'd be different. And she can't do it. She just can't do it. She does like the best. She 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 barely sort of like inches up to talking just a little bit about like, oh, you know, I've got some policies for uh, for building more homes. And she's basically she's emphasizing um, a, a sort of a, a something like a little bit of an abundance agenda type thing. But it's really just the same Biden approach to the economy, which is identify stuff that like voters say isn't working. And then we're going to spend money on it or do tax breaks for it or like have industrial policy for it. It's the exact same thing that Biden has been doing. It's no real difference. It's just a it's just the next step in the Biden agenda. And it's just remarkable that she cannot differentiate herself, despite the fact that she is trying to run on I'm different and you should vote for me, even if you don't like Joe Biden. She cannot differentiate herself. And then there's this amazing exchange where uh, where uh, Byer brings in talking about Trump um, and like, well, you know, Trump saying all this stuff and like and she's and she launches into this thing about like, you know, you know, the, the thing that makes me different is, you know what I mean? And, and Byers just like, I do not know what you mean. Like, I just like, and this, and people complained about this interview. One of the things I liked actually in some ways was, uh, was all the interruption, was the aggressiveness of it uh, because it stopped, uh, it stopped Harris from just repeating the talking points that she has repeated in the half dozen interviews that she's given. And Byer would just sort of be like, nope, you've said that before. Let's go on. Let's give me something new. Give me something new. That was, his, that was the point of all of the interruptions. And she just, she didn't have anything to say. Like you, you, your answer cannot be. Uh, to the American people, you know what I mean. If you are the president, if you're running for the president of the United States, your job is to describe specifically what it is you mean, not to refer and just sort of leave it unsaid in some bizarre kind of Straussian sense. It's not like you're on a Hangout podcast and everybody just knows what you're talking about already and you don't have to explain yourself. You are, your job is to be the president and to say specifically and precisely what you mean. And Harris does not like doing that. And that was the big thing that we learned from that interview. Uh, Slade, you know what I mean when I say what's one takeaway <laughs> that you had from in this a interview? lightning round in a lightning round. So. Similarly, I, I felt like the question where she was asked um, if at any point she had any concerns about Joe Biden's fitness to be running for reelection, and she just had to dodge the question. It made me, but it made me realize what an impossible situation her party has put her in. Because of course, at the time, even if she was fully aware that he was unfit to be running for reelection and could not could not possibly serve another term as president. Um, you know, you're the vice president. You can't be seen as pushing your boss out, right? This this would be this would be held up as like a coup. She would be held up as this power hungry person who, you know, it, behaving in an un unethical manner. She couldn't be the one actually to doom very much at all about the problem, even if she was aware of it. But at the same time, the voters want to know what did you know and when and and did you hide and you know, how can you justify hiding it from us? And you know, aren't you? Running for for president, asking us to trust your judgment, and and your and believe that you, for example, would be 
sort of have the courage to do make a difficult choice and do something in a difficult situation that needs to be done. And she obviously couldn't have done it. She didn't do it in this case. And so it just there was no right answer for her. In that sense, I felt a little bit of pity. But it's mostly just like just like just, you know, fury at the party that they put both her and and the American people in the situation where there was there was no, you know, where, where the transparency was so lacking and there was no real process to figure out who the, the Democratic nominee should be. I invite people to watch that exchange because it's one that I've been particularly very interested in because it's the 87th day of her running for president and the first time yeah. that she was asked this question. Hey, when did you notice that uh, the boss was Including that Joe uh, or that Donald Trump didn't ask her that during the one debate that they had, which was kind of bizarre. Right. Uh, and look at the look on her face when he asked her the question. Yeah. Because she is terrified she yeah. is she is a rabbit experiencing thorn at that moment you've had that's the big uh takeaway right that she you know it was a good idea to go on fox news and to go into the lion's den and everything and then she didn't prepare or didn't you know didn't have banter uh that you know i mean it, i think what that does is it confirmed to the you know few relatively few people who watched it or care about it it really it confirmed the idea that she was not ready for prime time um, and that that's why you have a longer vetting process for presidential candidates. Seven million, uh, seven plus million people uh, watch yeah, that. Yeah, a drop huge, in the bucket. Huge cable news. I, uh, Nick, what was your takeaway? Yeah, my well, my takeaway, of course, Matt, and I think you knew this from the minute that you started reading Twitter late last night or this morning, it had less to do with Brett Baer. And uh, I was going to say Nancy Kerrigan. I don't know why. Kamala wow. Harris. Yeah, that's like. <laughs> uh, but uh, no, it's the the Trump, the double whammy of the McDonald's <laughs> window thing and the story about Arnold Palmer's genitalia. It's like I think we may have just broken loose of all timelines that make any sense anymore. And we are now in a place where, you know, anything is possible, Matt, because could you have imagined any scenario in a million multiverses where a presidential candidate who had already been president once started talking about Arnold Palmer's cock to, you know, in a swing state, <laughs> you know, I mean, it was at Latrobe, Pennsylvania. I mean, it's just like, OK, this is it. Like we are fully in a Philip K. Dick universe at this point. Uh, it's been like that uh, for That's a while. That whole event with small potatoes. Let's yeah, sure. uh, go to our end of podcast, what we've all been consuming in the uh, cultural arena. Peter, why don't you lead us off? I watched Slow Horses season four. There's a case to be made that it is the best show running on television, in part because it is the show that is running on television in the way that television should be run, which is to say there's a new season every year. And we've entered this weird world in streaming where it's, uh, also not on streaming, but like in the, the streaming era where it's not uncommon for even quite popular series to have a two or two and a half year break between seasons. Now, a little bit of that is because of COVID and the strike, some issues that like showrunners and production managers can't really can't really work around. At the same time, like remember when television, like if you had a show on television, the first episode would be probably in September, maybe October, and then it would run through, you know, April or May or so, and that was that. And like it just happened every September until they canceled it. And now I think there's a lot of better things about this world, but the 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 big gaps between seasons uh, are, are really frustrating. And Slow Horses doesn't do that. You get a great season of television. It's really crisply produced. Gary Oldman is drunk and mangy and awful and hilarious and just like farts and screams his way through the season every time. It's so delightful. He's so terrible and so wonderful. And I, I just I enjoy I, I, I enjoy the sort of the, the effectiveness of the show. It's sharply written and, and nicely acted. Uh, but I also enjoy that it's reliable. More television shows should be reliably produced every year or so. What is it about, Peter? Uh, it's a British spy thriller. It's actually it's so it's interestingly libertarian in some ways because it is a British spy thriller that is about uh, the uh, department of basically screw ups, the foul ups who have been relegated to you're not fired, but you've been put in this division that is run by an old drunk uh, because we don't trust you because you are a 
you've screwed up somehow or another. Either you botched a mission or you're a drug addict or you've got some deep personal issues that you got to work through. So you're going to go to this thing they call Slough House that is run by Gary Oldman. Well, it turns out that Slough House ends up kind of saving the day all the time because this is really a show about the security apparatus bureaucracy in the UK and how self-interested and self-dealing and awful it is at actually doing the job of protecting people. And so the people who are good at, at protecting folks end up being uh, end up being the screw ups who are not in who are not as concerned about the bureaucracy, but are just trying sort of desperately and sort of stupidly to do their jobs well. Uh, Nick, what did you consume? Uh, I've been watching uh, there are three episodes so far of the HBO series The Franchise, which is uh, made by uh, the guy, one of the guys who created Succession, one of the people who created Veep, and the uh, director of the early Spider Man. Uh, the good Spider-Man movies, and uh, it is set at a superhero kind of tentpole franchise movie that is being done, and it is a send-up of that and all of the stupidness and shittiness of it, and it actually breathes a little bit of life into a dying genre, which is movies about making movies, because nobody really cares anymore. That's been thoroughly deconstructed, and I think Hollywood much that it would like to believe is still, you know, the dream merchants of everyday life and all of us in our little shitty existences, you know, sit in, you know, cushy seats in theaters and dream about being in the, you know, on the silver screen. It's not quite there anymore, but this is a very funny, very knowing uh, parody and satire of a sunset industry, which is, you know, gigantic movie studios uh, wringing the last possible drop of uh, juice and money out of worn out uh, formulas. I highly recommend it. And I also, partly I fell asleep watching the third episode and somehow uh, uh, the uh, app for whatever I was watching it on, I guess it was HBO Max or something, it kicked me over to the, uh, the great 1930 uh, movie, uh, 1918 West Front by G.W. Pabst, which is kind of like All Quiet on the Western Front, but from a fully German perspective, uh, which is an absolutely horrifying and wonderful picture to watch as we ponder uh, war, you know, in a way that we haven't in a long time. Uh, the portrayals of uh, shell-shocked veterans at the end on, on the losing side of World War I uh, is fantastic. Slade, what did you uh, consume? Uh, over the weekend, I finished reading a biography of Friedrich Hayek, the Nobel-winning libertarian economist. It's This is uh, one by Alan Ebenstein. I maybe am not pronouncing his name right. It's about 20 years old at this point. It's not the newest biography by Bruce Caldwell that came out recently um, of, of Hayek. I haven't re I have that one, but I haven't read it yet. Um, so this one is older, um, but I like it because it's, it's shorter, actually. The, the Bruce Caldwell one is going to be two volumes, and both volumes are significantly longer than this one one volume work from 20 years ago. It is um, it's it's just like interesting and readable and short, short little paragraphs, which um, is making me question everything in life because I'm working on a book right now that has a small number of long, long paragraphs. And I feel like, no, this this format is so much better. Short paragraphs, each one interesting and readable. And you can read it in five minutes or something. Um, and you learn a lot about this guy who is a sort of libertarian hero for many people, including things about his relationship with other characters from history that we all know. So, for example, a thing that I wasn't totally clear on is that uh, Hayek was actually much closer to Keynes, who we, we think of as being his primary sort of um, intellectual antagonist. Um, but they they overlapped uh, at Cambridge and um, they, they became very close. Uh, and he was closer to Keynes than he was with Milton Friedman, who we think of as being an ally of Hayek. They overlapped at the University of Chicago years later, but were in different departments. And while they were friendly, they were not really that good of friends and they were not colleagues because they were in different departments. So you just learn these interesting things about characters that we all know about, but maybe don't haven't gone as deep as we might like. So uh, I, at uh, almost at Nick uh, Gillespie's suggestion, I was going to do it anyways, went and saw a musician I talked about a few weeks back, Sturgill Simpson. Um, who's also uh, traveling in the name of Johnny Blue Skies for obscure reasons right now, uh, perform uh, is a, a sort of a honky-tonk country rock, uh, but also kind of psychedelic uh, and just weird uh, musician guy who I've just sort of fallen into the uh, the spell of. So he played at uh, Forest Hills Stadium here in uh, Queens, New York, 
uh, which is an interesting place uh, to watch a concert. Um, don't it's really hard to park. Uh, very strange venue. Uh, but anyways, uh, he played and he's just, in, he's a very weird and gifted musician. He's got a very good band and he's, uh, I don't think I've seen anything quite like it. Like uh, played more than three hours, which is not something I've seen much outside of uh, Bruce Springsteen or or The Cure, strangely enough. Um, and, uh, you know, he's has he's put out about eight records, has a pretty decent catalog to draw from and certainly drew from it. But also like, wanted to play a bunch of classic rock songs. So he's like playing Purple Rain and Wider Shade of Pale and Midnight Rider by the Allman Brothers and L.A. Woman, Nick Gillespie. Um, and, uh, and the band kind of vibrated the most doing those songs. So I'm looking forward to... And he's a very good guitar player himself. It's like a five-piece band with keyboards. Uh, he has a, an Estonian playing lead and slide and pedal steel, who's a really very David Lindley-like uh, expert musician. And Sturgill himself loves to take himself a solo, so they're doing a lot of long guitar solos and things like that. Um, and uh, I think, hopefully, his next record is just going to be doing Led Zeppelin songs or like or writing new ones for himself because clearly the band wants to go in that direction. It's a really interesting uh, thing. I, he's the tour is ongoing. He's going down to the hurricane Helene ravaged States next, uh, highly recommended. Give yourself, uh, you know, give yourself some, some, <laughs> some pace to sit through the whole, uh, the whole thing or dance through the whole thing. But uh, he's an interesting artist uh, at a time when there aren't a lot of interesting artists and has a nice, a nice, uh, voice and, uh, and just as kind of a bizarre character. So check it out. Sturgill Simpson, etc. cetera. Um, Matt, right. did you yes, see either X or the Beach Boys on their latest swing through uh, places like uh, Manhattan's Town Hall X, and uh, uh, Staten Island? X was uh, played there as they're doing their farewell uh, yeah. tour with the original lineup, including Billy Zoom. Mm-hmm. Um, and I had a choice either to do that or to go on a pre-planned uh, jaunt upstate. And I chose yeah. the pre-planned jaunt upstate because I have seen uh, one of the best concerts I ever went to is I stumbled after a Dodgers playoff game and literally wow. stumbled because I was wasted uh, across the street after drinking at a gay Mexican bar. Um, it's not important. And I heard some noise. How were the martinis? I uh, couldn't tell you, but I can tell you that uh, that that pool table did not like the size of the beer that I spilled on it. Uh, anyways, as I was running out of that place, um, I heard some noise across the street in Echo Park. Uh, and it was a secret show that X was playing the first time with Billy Zoom uh, in like 15 years. Yeah. Um, and we're like, hey, that sounds a lot like X. Uh, is that X? <laughs> And they're like, yeah, it's Secret Show. You want to come in? Uh, and walked in and stood two feet away from one of the greatest LA bands of all time uh, as they were like getting their their uh, calisthenics back in. So I don't need to see them again after that. Um, but I do appreciate the fact that at late in their late career, they just went ahead and released two really loud records uh, and then went out kind of, you know, on top or defiant or anything. So long live X. Pour out a beer on your local gay Mexican pool table if you can. Uh, All right, that's all the random stories that we have time for here at the Reason Roundtable podcast. We have lots of podcasts. Check them out at reason.com slash podcasts. Some of them involve Nick Gillespie, uh, as do some of our events, which are uh, attainable, findable at reason.com slash events. Nick, surely you have some events besides the live Reason Roundtable taping the night before the election here at the Village Underground in New York City. But there's some other stuff you would like to point us towards. Yes, I wanted to uh, point people to this Thursday. I'll be interviewing Musa Al Garbi. He's a sociologist at Stony Brook uh, University, uh, works with Heterodox Academy, and has a book out called We Have Never Been Woke, which touches on some of the issues that both Peter and Slade and I think myself brought up about uh, the symbolic capitalist class or the creative class and their uh, disjuncture with uh, the very people that they seem to care about in terms of non-college uh, educated working people and things like that. Uh, and then in November, uh, I will be doing a live interview with Martin Gurry, who was also name checked earlier, uh, who wrote a great book 10 years ago called The Revolt of the Public and is one of the keenest uh, analysts of this you know, post Arnold Palmer's genitalia timeline that we're 
hurtling into i, I think we're uh, mid genitalia yeah, i don't know i'm i'm thinking i'm trying to think of like is there somebody on kamala harris's team who's like how can we get a nancy lopez reference into this somehow to bring over the latinos that we're losing i don't wow. know you yeah. know or at least maybe a chi chi rodriguez something there's got to be something there matt uh that but even, all of that go to reason.com slash events and you'll see everything we're doing including soha fora and uh flora flora and fauna and that flora. is all the time for nick gillespie's mental filing cabinets yeah. we have uh this week uh thanks for listening um and uh thank you slate for gracing yes. us with your presence and intelligence and wits uh and goodbye